this is Alice Formiga of eOrganic, and I'd like to welcome you all to the webinar on seed potato production by Rue Genger of the University of Wisconsin. We hope that everyone in our audience today is safe and healthy, and um, I know many of you um, that normally work somewhere else are on home internet connections, so I hope that you're able to watch the entire thing. Um, eOrganic publishes free articles, videos, and webinars about organic farming and research, and you can find all of them on our new website at eOrganic.org, as well as on the eOrganic YouTube channel. This webinar will last approximately 45 minutes, and then when it's over, we'll have 30 minutes for questions. So today, I'd like to welcome Rue Genger, um, who is a researcher at the Department of Horticulture at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. They've been working with organic growers for the past 13 years to trial potato varieties and produce seed potatoes. I also wanted to mention that this webinar is part of a collaboration between the Organic Seed Alliance, North Circle Seeds, and North Central SARE, who has generously provided funding for this webinar. So with that, I'm going to hand over the remote control of the screen to our presenter, Rue Ginger. So, um, Rue, you should now have control, so just click on the screen once and it should activate. Okay, thank you very much, Alice, and I appreciate the introduction and uh, eOrganic for helping us host this webinar. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today for the webinar. As Alice said, uh, I'm Rue Ginger and uh, I've been working with organic growers on issues related to seed potato production uh, for about the last 13 years. So today what I'm, whoops, today what I'm going to talk about is um, I've divided the talk really into three parts. Um, I'll start out by talking about why the quality of seed potatoes is important and how the seed potato certification system works. Um, I'll then go on to talk about ways in which that system does and does not serve organic growers and how we might be able to interact with it in order to uh, have it serve organic growers better. And then I'm going to finish up the talk by uh, describing some work that we've been doing um, with organic growers to, um, to have them participate in potato breeding and selection and ways in which that has developed into an alternative seed potato system that starts with true potato seeds. We're actually going to start out um, the webinar with three polls because uh, it would be great to know a little bit more about um, about reasons that um, you all in the audience are interested in seed potatoes. So Alice has just shared those polls and if you want to go through and um, and fill out those those polls then once everyone has participated or the majority have participated Alice will uh, share those results. So it looks like um, about a third of you who are uh, joining us today look for certified seed potatoes um, and, um, and definitely organic as well. Um, so that's great. I think a lot of what I talk about will be hopefully familiar to you or at least it's already on your minds. Um, about half of you purchasing seed potatoes from directly from a seed company and about uh, a little less than a third directly from the grower and um, some people who are saving your own seed potatoes too and a fair degree of satisfaction with varieties that you can obtain so that's that's great um, and we'll certainly talk a good deal more about varieties okay thank you alice mm -hmm. all right so we all want healthy potato crops, and while um, health of our plants definitely uh, starts with the soil, it also starts with having healthy seed. And potatoes, as you all undoubtedly know, are vegetatively propagated. And one of the things that results from that is that many diseases can be passed to the next generation in the seed potatoes. So over multiple years, if you're saving seed potatoes and planting them back, Gradually, uh, diseases and pathogens accumulate in those seed potatoes 
and that can reduce their vigor and eventually result in failure of the crop. Historically, that was termed running out. Now that we know more about the diseases that affect potatoes, uh, we have some strategies to do something about that. And in the picture here, I just want to draw your attention to the uh, virus infected plant on the left. Uh, compared to the healthy plant, uh, the virus infected plant is significantly stunted. And it's infected with a virus called potato virus Y that I'll refer to quite a bit during the talk which is the most common cause uh, for seed lots to be rejected from seed potato certification. So it's one of the most important diseases to control for. So, oop. All right, so since we have these viruses to contend with, um, the seed potato certification system ensures freedom from disease or keeps disease under control using three different methods. And uh, the first is to start with disease-free planting stock. Uh, then the second is to have a limited number of generations in the field, which is also referred to as a flush through system. And then finally, to have regular inspections of the crop, uh, both during the growing season and also at and after harvest. So I'm gonna go through these one by one. So to start with disease-free planting stock, for potatoes, potatoes are generally maintained as tissue culture plantlets. And you can see a plant here on the left of your screen, uh, which is growing in a nutrient medium in a sterile container. And these plants are tested generally for about uh, 12 or 13 different viruses and viroids, and they're maintained in a way that keeps them free from any bacterial or fungal contaminants. So this is how um, most potato varieties are maintained uh, in the commercial system. And then in order to produce plants, or sorry, to produce tubers, the plantlets are transferred into pots in a greenhouse uh, or sometimes into a hydroponic or aeroponic system in order to produce small tubers that can then be planted outdoors. So these tubers being grown in a protected environment uh, can be kept disease free. So then we move to the uh, approach of limiting the number of field generations in the system. And as I said, this is called a flush through system because you're always starting with disease free material and then it's propagated in the field for a certain number of years. And then it uh, is sold as seed potatoes to a grower who is growing for table stock. In general, the, um, the crops can be replanted for five to seven years and still meet the requirements for a uh, foundation seed potato crop. So at this point I'm introducing, actually I'll just go back, I'm introducing two terms, foundation seed potatoes and certified seed potatoes. So foundation seed potatoes are the grade of potato that can be planted in order to produce a seed crop whereas certified seed potatoes are the, the grade of potato that is planted by a grower to produce potatoes for the table. So then moving on to the third uh, part of the certified seed potato system, this is inspection of the crop in the field at harvest and after harvest. Generally, Inspections uh, during the growing season are done fairly early in the season to look for diseases that may have come in with the seed. So uh, mostly viral infections, but then also some bacterial diseases and fungal diseases can be seen early in the season. Inspectors will come back later in the season to look for uh, diseases that may have moved into the crop uh, during the season where they're carried by aphids. Um, since there are a number of viruses that can be carried by aphids or whether they may have come in uh, by airborne spores uh, in the case of diseases such as early blight or late blight. There's also an inspection at harvest and a post-harvest inspection. So you might be wondering um, why a post-harvest inspection is necessary when there's so much inspection during the season and also at harvest. And the reason for that is that viruses that move in with aphids uh, can come into a crop 
fairly late in the season at a point where the plants are not necessarily going to express symptoms in the leaves and so they may go undetected. For this reason, a sample generally of about 400 tubers is taken from a seed lot and uh, that is treated in a way that breaks dormancy and that allows those potatoes to be planted uh, over the winter. Generally, um, post-harvest testing is done uh, either in Florida or now in Hawaii. And uh, the inspectors will walk the fields, look for any symptoms of disease, and if there are suspicious symptoms, they will send in leaf samples to be tested. And so that gives a much more accurate picture of what the true disease incidence is in that crop. So there are a number of more damaging diseases for which there's a zero tolerance, and I've listed spindle tuber viroid and bacterial ring rot as the main ones here. And then for viruses that are less damaging, there is a tolerance for those, which in the case of foundation seed potatoes is half a percent, and in the case of certified seed potatoes is 5%. So half a percent uh, is as much as you would want if you are going to plant that crop back because it's not uncommon for the level of viruses in a crop to increase by tenfold over the course of a year. Okay, so that's a fairly brief description of how the certified seed potato system works. And in the years that I've been working um, with uh, growers, to, uh, to look at how the system works for them on their farms. There are some clear gaps in the organic seed potato supply and how uh, that supply works out for organic growers. So as you might imagine, the seed potato system is oriented to the economy of large scale production. The uh, conventional potato crop is uh, centered, certainly it produces a lot of fresh market potatoes, but it is also centered very much around processing potatoes for the potato chip industry and also for French fries. And so it tends to be geared to producing large volumes of a relatively limited set of varieties. So when you are interacting with a system that is geared to such a large scale, for organic producers who are generally operating at a smaller scale and in an industry where the volume overall is smaller, you end up with fairly limited sources of organically produced seed potatoes and limited sources of varieties that have been selected because they thrive in organic systems. Also limited sources of specialty varieties. Um, as an example from Wisconsin, uh, looking at the varieties that are available through the Wisconsin system, 13 of those varieties are chipping varieties, um, 14 are russet varieties, that's out of a total of 46 varieties. Um, so that's like 27 of the 46 that are more aimed at the processing market. Then there are eight red varieties, four yellows, a white variety that is a fresh market variety and six specialty varieties. So you can see just in those numbers the preponderance of the French fry and chipping market. So what are some ways that we can go about building capacity for organic seed potato production? Um, right now, as I said, we have limited regional sources. Oh, I think I skipped ahead a little bit. I'm sorry, we have limited regional sources of organically produced certified seed potatoes. Uh, I know that here in the Midwest, we have just two growers who are producing certified seed potatoes and are also organically certified. Uh, in Maine, there are another couple of growers, there's one in Idaho, and then a number of seed companies are reselling uh, organically produced certified seed potatoes. But really we have just a handful of people who are doing this production. Um, and also we have a limited number of varieties. So we need more organic producers of certified seed potatoes. I think that um, to me is, is something that is pretty clear. And I'm hoping that you'll come away from this webinar with a better idea of what it might take 
for you to become an organic producer of certified seed potatoes. Also because the system as it is set up now is oriented to larger scale production, one of the things that I'm interested in exploring is a more cooperative model where we can uh, aggregate the demand for um, varieties that do well in organic systems and for specialty varieties in order to get more of these varieties into the seed potato system. So what I want to talk about now is uh, some details of how to become a certified seed potato producer, what that takes um, for those of you who might be thinking about that as a direction. So the first step um, since certification of seed potatoes is um, managed at, and regulated at the state level, the first step is to reach out to your state seed potato certification agency. And I've listed here the states in the US that have a certification agency. So if you live in one of those states, then your first step would be to get in touch with, uh, with that agency. But I can tell you that um, the common requirements across all of these agencies is that if you're producing certified seed potatoes, you need to plant only foundation class seed potatoes on your farm. And any potatoes that you're producing on the farm will need to go through inspection, even if you do not submit them for post harvest testing and certification. So the reason for this is that there are a number of diseases in potatoes that are airborne. Also, there's definitely the potential for, um, there is the potential for disease spread between fields if you're moving through fields with equipment. Uh, so really the entire crop has to be managed as a seed crop. And so I see a question that uh, someone's wondering what they should do if they live in a state that doesn't have an agency. Um, depending on how close you are to a neighboring state that does have an agency, you might be able to work with them to uh, certify your seed potatoes, um, but that is going to that is going to vary uh, agency to agency. So that would have to be a, a personal contact to see if they're willing to work with you. So since I'm based in Wisconsin and we have a certification, a seed potato certification uh, agency, I'm just going to walk you through what it would look like if you as a Wisconsin grower wanted to start uh, growing certified seed potatoes. And the first thing to do would be to call up the director of the agency and have a phone consultation to, uh, to just share what your goals are and to talk about the, uh, the process and make sure that it's going to be a good fit. Um, once you uh, decide that you want to go ahead, uh, the um, inspectors like to visit any new growers uh, to take a look at their facility, to take a look at their equipment and especially their storage since storage of seed potatoes is a really big issue in terms of their quality. Um, and so there are some fees that come along with that for the, the time of the inspector and their travel time. So assuming that um, you get through that, the next step is to order your foundation seed potatoes. In Wisconsin, we have a state uh, seed potato farm that produces foundation seed potatoes and they uh, charge 50 cents for 100 pounds, 100 weight of those with a minimum order per variety of 500 weight. So you can also bring in foundation seed potatoes from other states if there are other varieties you're interested in that you can't get in Wisconsin, they just have to meet that foundation seed potato standard. So let's say you have your, your seed potatoes, you've planted them, everything's looking good and they're coming up nicely. The next step is that uh, inspectors are gonna come and visit your farm, walk the field, um, take a look for uh, any symptoms of disease that might be showing up and they're gonna be available to consult with you and, um, and talk with you about that uh, because they really want you to succeed. Um, and for the smaller scale farm uh, that is uh, small scale on the, the uh, standard of conventional potatoes, 
uh, that we have here in Wisconsin that is growing organic seed potatoes. Um, they are paying a $40 per acre fee with a five acre minimum for those on-site inspections for the early and late season diseases and also at harvest. Um, so then once you've gotten through those inspections, uh, you go through uh, and decide what you're going to submit for the post-harvest testing. Um, and that is a sample of 400 tubers that, uh, as I mentioned before, will be grown out over the winter for inspection and testing and the charge for that is $200 per seed lot. The results from that inspection and testing come back in January, which is a great um, time for people to be placing their seed potato orders with you. And if you want to ship out of state at that point, you would need a state inspection to get what's called a blue tag so that you can ship across state lines. And that is a charge of 22 cents per hundredweight plus the hourly rate that the state inspectors charge. So that gives you pretty much the breakdown of what you would be looking at in that first year. Um, and going on past that, you would be going through the same process, expect, except that you would not need to have that new grower pre-production inspection. Uh, I'm just noticing a question that came up about what qualifies as a foundation seed potato. Um, you know, I think I might actually have to start leaving the questions till the end so that we get through everything. Uh, but I will just mention quickly that a foundation seed potato is uh, produced from um, disease-free stock and must meet a standard of having less than half a percent of virus. So that's um, no more than one tuber in a sample of 200 that shows any evidence of virus. Okay. All right, so some of the research that I've done uh, in the past has been focused around um, looking at the feasibility of organic seed potato production in the Midwest. And uh, when I started doing this research, that was in 2007, and at that point, uh, the Wisconsin farm that produces certified seed potatoes and is organic certified was, uh, had been producing seed potatoes since 2003. And I was interested in looking at production uh, of seed potatoes on farm in various regions of the state to see how feasible this might be in uh, a wider range of environments. Uh, I do want to mention that since that point, um, Carter Farms in North Dakota uh, has begun producing certified organic, certified seed potatoes as well. So now we have two producers in the Midwest, which is great. So our initial trials on farm were uh, from 2007 uh, uh, to 2008, and we uh, worked with farms in the south of the state, uh, which is an area that is um, where potato production is less common. Uh, a couple of locations in the central sands, which is um, a very intensive potato production area. And then a farm in the county which produces uh, the vast majority of the certified seed potato crop in Wisconsin, um, Langlade County. So, I want to show you the results from those two years. And what I've done here is break up uh, the location or break up the, the results from the farms by location. So we have the farms from southern Wisconsin, the two locations in central Wisconsin, and then the one farm in northern Wisconsin. And as you look along the bottom of this graph, uh, you'll see that I've broken it up by year 2007 and 2008 and also by whether the variety we were looking at showed resistance to the strains of PPY that we had at that time or was susceptible to those strains. And up here on the y-axis, you have the incidence of PPY and a bar across showing the 5% cutoff rate. So what you can immediately see is that the farms in southern Wisconsin had lower levels of potato virus Y and remember, this is the virus that is the um, 
the one that is most commonly a problem in certification of seed potatoes. So these farms in southern Wisconsin um, had the lowest rate of potato virus Y in the plots that we had planted on their farms. And we were not asking the farms to plant all foundation seed potatoes, so they were also uh, planting just certified and um, some saved seed uh, on their farms. So even uh, in that situation, we were able to see um, a situation where most of the seed lots were able to meet the certification requirements. Looking at central Wisconsin, there was a higher rate of potato virus Y overall, and in 2007, a majority of the susceptible seed lots did show quite high levels of potato virus Y that would not have allowed them to meet certification. And we had a similar situation in northern Wisconsin uh, at the, the farm in the middle of the certified seed production area, where in 2008, we saw high levels of potato virus Y in the susceptible lines. So overall, though, this is a pretty encouraging picture. It does uh, tend to emphasize that isolation is important to avoid being near sources of inoculum for potato diseases. As I've mentioned, um, potato viruses are carried, are spread by aphids. And um, obviously, if you can be uh, further away from other potato fields, you're going to be more isolated from those, those aphids that tend to multiply in the potato fields. And also, if you have the opportunity to plant varieties that are resistant to the diseases you're trying to control, that's going to be an advantage as well. Uh, we came back to this uh, in more recent years and looked at, um, took a similar approach, but across a wider region where we had farms in uh, Minnesota and North Dakota, as well as in Wisconsin participating. And what you see across the top is the number of farms participating. We had the most in 2016 and 2018. And um, then we have uh, farms with no PBY found in their seed lots. And then I've just listed out the seed lots with 0%, less than 5% or more than 5% PBY. And what you'll notice is that where we found no PVY, no potato virus Y on the farms, we are seeing mostly that they are smaller scale farms that are more isolated from potato production. Whereas in cases where seed lots were um, over 5% potato virus Y and sometimes quite a bit over, these were farms that were larger scale, had um, and we're in regions where a lot of other potato production is going on. So this definitely um, leads us to believe that uh, certified seed potato production is going to be more likely to succeed if you're more isolated from potato production regions. Um, it's important to remember that conventional seed potato producers use uh, quite a lot of insecticides and fungicides. Um, which are not an option in the same way for organic producers. So uh, being isolated from other potato production is definitely a big advantage. Uh, if it's possible to plant disease resistant varieties, that's also going to be helpful. And as I've mentioned, we weren't in a situation where the farms were able to plant all foundation seed. So as a certified seed potato grower uh, and doing that, that would also limit the sources of disease inoculum on the farm. So uh, we were not removing any infected plants um, from other parts of the, of the farm. And as a certified seed potato producer, this is definitely uh, something that you want to do is to learn the disease symptoms so that you can walk your fields yourself and rogue fields to uh, remove any infected plants. So I want to change gears a little bit now and um, talk about increasing access to desired varieties for organic producers. I mentioned um, earlier the numbers of uh, different types of varieties that are in the Wisconsin seed potato system, where the majority are chipping varieties or russets, and um, there's a few specialty varieties, uh, some reds, yellows, and um, 
periodically over the last uh, 10 to 15 years as I've been working in this area, uh, I've gotten emails from the, uh, the certification lab saying, well, we're seeing lower orders for this variety and we're thinking about dropping it. So that's definitely something that happens. And so I was curious to know what the, um, what their requirements are to keep a variety in the system. So um, talking to them, the minimum order, as I, I mentioned before, is 500 pounds or 500 weight. But if someone is the sole buyer for that variety, the minimum order then is 1,000 um, pounds. So the cost is $50 for 100 pounds or $75 if it's a fingerling variety. And this gives you a picture of what that minimum requirement is for a variety to be, um, to be worth keeping in the system, at least for the Wisconsin system. If we back up the system a little bit and go a little bit higher up the, um, up the production chain, if you wanted to get those disease-free mini tubers, you would be looking at 55 cents per tuber and a 1200 um, tuber number as the minimum order. So again, that is gonna be a sufficient order for them to keep a variety in the system. If the variety you're interested in is not in the system yet, then the cost to introduce it into the state potato tissue culture lab is $500, which allows them to do the testing for all of the viruses, viroids, and other pathogens that they need to make sure are not present. So this is kind of the, the economics of how we maintain access and how we get access to desired varieties. Um, just to run through that again with two different examples, if you were looking at a popular variety where multiple growers are interested in it, um, you'd be looking at $500 to introduce it, and then each grower would be um, getting 500 pounds of foundation seed at a cost of $250. If it's a niche variety, a fingerling that only one person is interested in, again, it's gonna be $500 to introduce, and then $750 for 1,000 pounds of foundation seed in each year. So this is really based on the economics of the system, and um, this is, uh, this is something that they follow pretty closely in terms of which varieties are worthwhile for them to keep in their system. Now, personally, I'm really interested in heirloom varieties. And for the last 10 years, I've been working with Seed Savers Exchange to go through some of the heirloom varieties in their collection. They have more than 500 varieties. Uh, we chose 100 to, uh, to start working with. Um, a lot of their varieties had a lot of virus infection at that time, and we've been slowly working our way through and um, producing disease-free seed for, or disease-free planting stock for those varieties. And at this point, we've trialed about 80 varieties on organic farms, a network of organic farms throughout the upper Midwest. And uh, just to kind of whet your appetite for these potatoes, uh, I wanna show you some of the ones that have risen to the top in our trials. And these have been assessed for their productivity, marketability, and also their flavor. Um, so some of the promising varieties we're looking at are um, Candy Stripe and Cherries Jubilee for the reds, a really lovely purple with white flesh called Purple Chief, uh, a couple of yellow varieties, Daisy Gold, Dutch Cream, and some uh, Fingerlings, Epicure Banana and Corn de Mouton. And I can tell you, having tried all of these, that they are delicious. Um, a few more purple varieties that um, I really like uh, Elmer's Blue, Early Blue, Purple Flesh Cow Horn, Huckleberry um, as a, a red flesh variety, and some multicolor varieties, Catriona and Australian Crawlers. And I mentioned these varieties because these are varieties that I will be, or I have the opportunity to get into the seed system uh, over the next year. And um, in talking to Seed Savers Exchange staff, uh, what came out of that conversation um, has led to me wanting to give a, a 
PSA right now, um, which is that there is potential for seed potato growers to contract with Seed Savers Exchange. Um, seed Savers is interested in expanding uh, access to the heirloom potatoes in their collection. Right now, there's just a few varieties that are available as certified seed potatoes, and they are interested in being able to offer them as uh, certified and also certified organic seed potatoes. So uh, they're looking for growers who can contract with them to produce minimum volumes of about 500 pounds per variety. And since this is also a point in my research where I'm interested in getting some of these more promising varieties into the system, uh, this seems like a, a good time to mention it to people out there who might be interested in growing. And uh, those of you who are interested in that opportunity, uh, I'll be able to connect you with the relevant people at Seed Savers Exchange to talk about that more. So um, I'm actually going to respond to uh, a couple more questions that have come through on certified seed potatoes. And then I'm going to switch gears and talk about participatory on-farm potato breeding. So uh, one question that was asked is, how effective is the three-step process you outlined in reducing viral infection of seed potatoes overall? And so um, I would say it's an extremely effective system. Um, when uh, there have been a number of studies of the economics of seed potato certification in increasing yield and profitability for um, for potato growers. Uh, I am afraid I haven't looked at that research for a while, but it is a pretty significant impact in um, increasing yields. And the spread of viruses is very variable from year to year. It depends very much on aphid movement. Um, the aphids that cause most of the viral spread don't overwinter in the upper Midwest. So they tend to be flying in and they're actually carried in on the jet stream. Um, so there are some years where we get a lot more, um, we get a lot more multiplication of aphids and we get a lot more aphids moving through and spreading virus. There are other years where it is um, much less of a problem, but the combination of always having clean material moving through, uh, of having regular inspections and of flushing out any material that is infected is extremely effective. So even if you do have a year where you have a lot of viral spread because of aphids, you have the opportunity to identify that and make sure that that is quickly moved out of the seed system so that it's not going to be hanging around the next year and causing problems. Um, then another question is, uh, is the five acre minimum contributing to the limited organic seed production? Um, I think that is possibly an issue. It's, it's not actually a minimum in terms of you being required to plant five acres. Um, that is just the minimum charge that the inspectors um, or that the certification program is requiring. And that's a $40 per acre charge. So that ends up being $200 essentially is a flat fee if you are growing less than five acres. So um, I'd certainly be happy to talk about the economics of seed potato production more, um, but we'll hold that for after the presentation. So um, I'm going to switch gears and talk about participatory I'm sorry, uh, talk about some work that we have done in the last few years uh, on participatory on-farm potato breeding. So everything I've talked to talked about to this point is vegetative potato production, where you're planting a variety, you're getting plants that are genetically identical to what, uh, to the tubers you planted, and then you are harvesting tubers that look identical to the ones that you planted. What I'm going to talk about now is potato propagation from 
true seeds, botanically speaking, true seeds. So uh, you may have seen potato berries on your plants in the past, and uh, if you open them up, please don't ever eat them. They're extremely bitter and toxic and bad for you. Um, but if you open up those fruit, uh, you'll see that they are internally very similar to a tomato and packed with uh, tiny little seeds. And each of these seeds is genetically unique. So if you go on and, um, and germinate these, uh, raise these seedlings. You can um, pot them up, uh, even pot them out into your field. And what you're gonna get from them is a range of different tuber types that are gonna be genetically distinct between each of these plants. And so what you see here is the level of variation that we saw uh, from a cross between uh, a variety called Spartan Splash and Adirondack Blue. Um, a Spartan Splash is a yellow with purple splashes, very similar to this tuba, and then Adirondack Blue has blue flesh. So we saw quite a range of tuba types. So um, one of the things that um, we were interested in was getting growers involved earlier uh, rather than simply sending out varieties for people to trial on their farms, we wanted to get growers involved earlier in selection of lines from true potato seed. And so um, we started off with a number of variety, with a number of growers of whom three um, were uh, successful in, um, in growing out lines from true potato seed and continued to participate in selection. And two of these growers are still maintaining lines for on-farm production. Um, if Zach is, Zach Page is on the call, uh, he can talk about whether he's also still maintaining lines. Um, and four of these lines were entered in uh, trials that I ran at our research station last year. All of them did, um, did quite well. There's one that I'm really interested in evaluating further this multicolor line and um, the three others that were red varieties uh, were kind of medium on yields but um, I'm still keeping them around we'll probably keep working with them for a little bit longer. Uh, another thing that we did was um, if you look at this uh, sorry if you look at this set of potatoes one of the things we were curious about was instead of taking a single potato and trying to propagate it clonally, as an on-farm level of, uh, or a, an on-farm scale seed potato system, what if you sorted these by tuber type and planted out uh, the different tuber types in essentially mixed progeny plots? So we had seven growers participate in that in 2016. Uh, we had four different crosses, which we sorted out into two or three different tuber types. And we asked people to rate them for their marketability and for their eating quality. And we started to get a picture from that of the crosses that gave us um, better varieties of potato. Um, and what we heard back from growers was that they Customers really enjoyed this. They, um, they found it interesting to have a mixture of potato types. And um, this seemed like a pretty successful approach, especially for markets where there are, um, where there's more acceptance of variability um, in the produce. So CSA markets or um, farmers markets, where there's an opportunity to communicate with your customers about why it is that they're seeing a few different types of potato. Um, I also did try similar trials at the research station and I know we're running pretty low on time, so I'm just gonna quickly say that I was pleased to see that productivity was pretty similar um, across the lines when we look at Czech varieties. So we have um, some clonal varieties, red Lasoda, an heirloom Fenton Blue, which was apparent for some of these and another heirloom sweet yellow dumpling, which was apparent for some of these. And we see that yield is pretty stable across these different populations. Um, and this is just a, another way of showing um, the same question. 
um, where we uh, had some of the parents of these lines in the same trials. And when you look at the productivity of the progeny, uh, you see that it's pretty comparable to the parents. And there are some pretty nice potatoes in there as well. And again, in the interest of time, I'll just keep on going. So this is something that uh, definitely lends itself to um, either a home gardener or to a situation where um, someone is homesteading or interested in maintaining their own collection of potatoes and with the possibility of, um, of finding a variety that you really like and that you really want to keep on, um, keep on maintaining. Uh, there's the opportunity to do this kind of small scale potato breeding and selection, where every year you can grow out your seedlings, uh, you can plant out a plot of mixed types and be able to select those that do best, uh, store those for replanting, eat the ones that you're not going to replant. And since you'll generally get enough potatoes off uh, a plant to put out another five to 10 plants the next year, you have the chance to do more detailed evaluations as you go on. So where are you going to get seeds from? Uh, you can simply collect berries of plants that produce them. And uh, I've worked with a number of open, these open pollinated lines where you only know the female parent. Most likely you'll be getting, uh, most of those seeds will be from self-pollination, but since uh, bumblebees do like to work potato flowers, if you have multiple varieties in your field, you'll probably get some crosses. Um, and I'm just going to mention here a number of varieties that I've worked with that have good fruit production. Um, so King Harry, Elba, Adirondack Blue, Chieftain and Caribe are commercially available. Yellow Rose and Early Bangor are two heirloom varieties in the Seed Savers collection. And uh, Picasso and Barbara are some multicolor varieties uh, that are European varieties. And I'll just skip past this. If you're interested in crossing, um, the advantage of course is that you can choose both the parents and uh, look for parents that have traits that are of interest to you. And I'm zipping through this uh, for the sake of time. But um, you um, know, you could just keep going a little slower because we don't have that many questions in the queue. So, um, oh, you know, okay. I think we all want to hear what you have to say <laughs> there. So yeah, don't, don't go too fast. <laughs> okay. In that case, I'm actually going to go back and I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about these. Um, I really wasn't sure when I started doing this how, uh, how good uh, the yields would be from open pollinated lines. And I was really pleased to see that for some of the parents, um, I got some really lovely potatoes and pretty good yields from them as well. Um, so Red Thumb was one of the ones that I really enjoyed. It's a um, fingerling potato that has good uh, female fertility and I got some really lovely different color fingerlings off that one. Um, so then, yeah, if you, if you are interested in crossing, Potatoes are pretty, um, are pretty uh, cooperative when it comes to making crosses. They have large flowers. Um, the petals um, will fold back so that you can easily access the, uh, the anthers and the stigma uh, of, the, of the flower. Um, so being able to, to choose both of the parents is great if you, are, if you have specific goals and you're trying to combine traits for different parents. Um, be aware that with, um, since potatoes have not really been selected for fertility, there are a number of varieties that simply don't have good male fertility and some that will not uh, bring fruit all the way to, uh, to ripening. So if you don't succeed, it may be that you're working with varieties that are just not very, uh, very fertile and it's worth persisting. One of the ways that you can tell whether your pollination has been successful is to look for a bend in the stem of the flower a couple of days after pollination and then as time goes on, you're going to see these little berries forming 
and you want to leave them on the plant for uh, about three weeks so that they can ripen up a little bit more and then let them ripen off the plant for a while. If people are interested, I do have a few extra slides later in the presentation uh, that talk about um, ripening the fruit and cleaning the seed. Uh, so resources for crossing potatoes. I really recommend this book, um, The Lost Art of Potato Breeding by Rebsy Fairholm. It is a very accessible guide uh, to potato breeding for enthusiasts that reminds us that um, potato breeding has not always been the province only of, um, of university scientists and uh, professional breeders, but it is something that all of us can do. Uh, there's also a very active Facebook group, the Kenosha Potato Project. Um, they're a very generous group with information and also with sharing seeds. Uh, there's also a good YouTube video on uh, how to cross pollinate both potatoes and tomatoes that you may be interested in looking up. So, um, and you can ask me for advice too. Um, so if you are looking to do some potato breeding and you're interested in finding some interesting varieties or breeding lines that have particular traits, uh, Seed Savers Exchange is a great uh, place to look for particular varieties, especially amongst the members. You can also go to the USDA Germplasm Resources Information Network, or GRIN. Um, it can be a little bit difficult to navigate, and I'm happy to help people with that. And you can also get in touch with me uh, to access some of the varieties that I've, I've talked about. Another way to get started in this is simply to buy seeds. And there are seeds available through a couple of, through a number of different companies, um, Cultivariable, Tatamata Seeds, and the Experimental Farm Network. So uh, I'm just going to close with this picture of um, indigenous varieties from uh, Peru and Bolivia. Um, you may know that potatoes were um, originally domesticated by the Quechua people uh, in the Andes of Peru and Bolivia. And um, I just, I love looking at all these different types of potato. And I also love this quote that the potato yields more nutritious food more quickly on less land and in harsher climates than any other major food crop. So um, with that, I will um, respond to any questions that people have. And um, thank you very much for, for listening. Um, one of them is, um, can we take off the berries earlier than three weeks? I tried to leave mine and then the bugs got to them. Can we harvest a few early? So um, I would suggest not trying to do that um, because the seeds really do need to be maturing uh, in that ripening berry. But I definitely understand about the bugs getting or um, sometimes the fruit simply falling off the plant. One thing that is actually quite successful is if you want to leave it on for, um, for a short time and then you can treat it like a cut flower and um, just cut off a little bit uh, lower on the stem so that you uh, maybe have a couple of leaves, put it in water, uh, bring it inside so that it is safe from the bugs, but it still has the opportunity to ripen up. Uh, so that is definitely one thing you can try. Another thing that people will do is to uh, make little mesh or cloth bags um, Mesh is probably best since you don't want it to uh, keep a lot of moisture and you can just put that over the berry as you see it start to form. Um, and that way that's going to protect it. And also if it does end up falling off, it's going to make it easier to, to find. Okay, thank you. Um, we had a question about um, desiccation in organic seed potatoes. Um, I don't know exactly what the person wanted to know about that, but um, do you have any comments about desiccation in organic seed potatoes? So in conventional, uh, in conventional seed potato production, desiccants are used to kill the vines uh, more rapidly. 
and uh, that is one way of killing the vines so that you don't have diseases coming in um, that can attack the foliage and also if you have a more uniform die down of the vines then the uh, the potatoes themselves forming in the ground will um, will start to harden off so they're easier to harvest so i assume that that's what the question is about um, I personally don't know of organic growers who use desiccants. Uh, what I'm more aware of is that people will um, will chop the vines uh, in order to kill them. It's not always completely successful. Some varieties will try to grow back. But if the variety is already starting to senesce, generally that is fairly successful in killing the vines and then usually uh, two to three weeks later, the potatoes will be harvested. Um, so I'm not aware of desiccants. I do know that uh, people sometimes will flame their potato vines as well in order to kill them. But I'm not aware of any OMRI approved desiccants for potato crops. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, somebody wanted to know your thoughts on cut versus whole tuber seeds. Oh, yeah. Um, if I am going to cut I, uh, my seed potatoes, I like to do it um, at least a few days ahead of time so that there is time for them to heal. In potatoes, um, in tubers, healing is an active process. It's not just that the, the wounded tuber dries up, but they produce a layer of superized tissue that is, um, that is a layer that will resist the entry of uh, fungal diseases or bacterial pathogens. Uh, so I prefer to plant whole seed if I can, uh, but if I am going to cut the seed, then you know I, I don't worry too much about that. I, I am happy to do that, but I do like to let it heal up for a couple of days. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, this person grows in multiple states and some don't have certification. How can we set standards and have third party certification? It's harder to grow clean crops in states where there are short rotations and poor seed lots are everywhere. We need to encourage more organic seed for various reasons for marketing. Yeah, I, I definitely agree that we need to encourage more organic seed. Um, so I'm curious, um, I think I see, yeah, uh, Jeff, I'm curious uh, whether you're talking about, uh, I assume you're talking about certification in terms of certified seed. Um, and in Wisconsin, there is a requirement now that just went, th it went through in 2017, I believe, that requires um, any farmers who grow more than five acres of potatoes to plant certified seed potatoes. And that was an attempt to, uh, to reduce the problem of um, diseased seed lots being replanted. Um, I think it's, I'm not sure how likely it is that issues like that would pass. Um, in other states, Wisconsin has a pretty um, large potato industry, and there's certainly um, there's certainly some political influence there um, that I think made it more feasible for that to pass in Wisconsin. Um, I guess education is the approach that I tend to take, um, and I think. Um, if we can get more people producing organic seed potatoes and it's more accessible and people see that the quality is good, um, then hopefully that's going to increase adoption. Um, but I'd be happy to, if you have follow-up questions, I'd be happy to talk more about that. Okay. Um, do you have any advice for germination and early stage plant care of seed? So I'm going to, I think that the, um, the PowerPoint is still visible to people. Oh yeah. And uh, so I'm going to go through to some of the, um, the slides I have about uh, starting from true potato seeds. 
So um, what I like to do is to plant several seeds. Um, you want to plant them very shallowly because they are um, such small seeds. And I have found that they tend to germinate better if they are planted in small groups. Uh, once they are about two to three inches tall, I will repot them. And um, they, they do tend to do much, they tend to be fairly leggy, even under pretty good amounts of light. They tend to be fairly tall and delicate seedlings. So I like to plant them quite deeply when I repot them. And um, they, being a very um, genetically variable crop, um, you will find that some of the seedlings are weaker. I tend to find that those don't really catch up. So I use that repotting as an opportunity to select out the strongest seedlings. And then as they keep on growing, I'll top up the soil around them and then transplant them out. If you're going to, you can simply uh, take them right through to tuber formation in a greenhouse, uh, but you can uh, also put them out in the field. You want to do that before the tubers start to form. Otherwise, it tends to set them back a fair amount. OK, um, that's great. Um, here's a person who's starting potatoes in his market garden for the first time. Would you recommend using a foundation potato for a clean start, or will aphids or economics make that less than practical? So for market gardening um, or any production that is for, um, for table stock potatoes, I would recommend using certified potatoes. Uh, but I wouldn't say that you need to use foundation seed potatoes. Um, certified seed potatoes um, will be, uh, they will have a slightly higher load um, but of viruses, but um, it's, the acceptable threshold is calculated out so that you uh, will not have an economic loss. Potatoes tend to fill in. If there are some plants that are weaker or if, um, if even one didn't come up, uh, the other plants will fill in and make up for the lost yield. So you end up, that is actually how the threshold of 5% was arrived at. Because um, if you look at a field of potatoes, if you went through and removed 10% of the plants, you would not see a yield impact for most varieties. So that was just cut in half to give the 5% threshold. Um, also, it can be pretty difficult to get hold of foundation seed potatoes if you are not a certified seed potato grower. Um, so just look for certified seed and, and that is going to do fine. Okay. Um, what kind of progress is being made for selecting varieties that are resistant to disease and insects? Uh, so there's some interesting progress uh, in both of those areas. Um, I, in terms of insects, there is uh, some good research being done in Michigan on varieties that are resistant to Colorado potato beetles. And the encouraging thing about that is that um, they are developing varieties that have um, less palatable foliage. And in the past, varieties that have been developed uh, with that trait often have had also less palatable tubers. Um, but the lines that they're working with now accumulate these um, these bitter tasting compounds in the leaves, but not in the tubers. So um, any of you who've grown potatoes and dealt with Colorado potato beetle know that that's going to be um, quite a big advantage. In terms of disease, there's a lot of research now on developing varieties that are resistant to potato virus Y. And um, less, but there is still some research, mainly in Europe, on varieties that are resistant to late blight. Um, one thing that I want to mention about potato breeding is that, um, I didn't introduce this during the talk, but potatoes are a tetrapoid crop, which means that they have, uh, rather than diploid, um, like us and a lot of other organisms where you get one set of chromosomes from your mother and one set from your father. 
um, potatoes actually have four sets of chromosomes and that has historically made them very difficult to breed because the um, these assortment of traits is a lot more complicated when you have four sets of chromosomes. There is a lot of breeding going on now with diploid potatoes, which are actually the progenitors of uh, what we consider the cultivated potato. And that is gonna speed up a lot of breeding for resistance and for, um, for other beneficial traits. Okay, um, let's see. This person would like to hear more about harvesting and seed production. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm not really sure whether that is about um, harvesting fruit for true seed, um, but I'm going to assume that it might be because I mentioned that I had more information about that. Um, so if I'm wrong, please, uh, please let us know. Um, so I've put up a slide uh, about harvesting fruit and cleaning seeds. You want to leave the fruit on the plant for three to five weeks um, after flowering, but if you need to take the fruit off uh, before five weeks, you can let it ripen just inside on your kitchen bench. Um, like I said, don't eat the fruit. They're very bitter and not good for you. Um, and then in terms of cleaning the seed, uh, you can just, once that uh, fruit is ripe, you can just squeeze seeds into water. Uh, you don't need to ferment the seeds as you do with tomato seed cleaning. Uh, you can just squeeze them out into water and rub them in your fingers to, uh, to rub off the pulp. Um, viable seeds will sink to the bottom and you can just pour off the pulp um, and rinse repeatedly until you don't have any pulp left let them dry and, um, and just store them somewhere cool and dry. I have also used a blender. Uh, you just need to, um, if you have masses of fruit, um, the seed will actually survive that. And uh, you don't, obviously you wanna only blend enough to break up the berries. And then you can go back to just pouring up the pulp and rinsing. Um, and the seed will, if they're stored in a cool, dry place, the seed will last for um, upwards of 10 years. So they're a, a really long-lived seed. Okay, um, let's see. In terms of desiccation, um, to follow up, is sulfuric oh. acid a as a desiccant acceptable in organic seed potato production? Do you know that by any chance? I do not know. Now, if um, somebody else knows that, maybe they can chime in here. Um, yeah, I mean, that's definitely something you'd want to ask a organic certifier. Yeah, I would definitely want to ask my certifier about something like that. Yeah. Okay. And then someone else asks if it's possible to use Agdia for generations outside of mini tubers. So um, Agdia, uh, for those who don't know, is a company that makes uh, testing kits for uh, for a whole range of different potato, uh, sorry, a whole range of different plant diseases, and they also do um, testing as a service. And yes, definitely, uh, I have sent them um, leaf samples, and I've sent them tissue culture plants. Um, they are really responsive and do a great job. So, if you're interested in um, getting some testing done by Agdia. Um, yeah, you can uh, go to their website and they have a link to their testing services. Okay, so someone very kindly ch chimed in to say no, sulfuric acid is not permissible um, mm -hmm. in organic seed production. And so um, thanks for that. Um, okay, and then someone else um, asks, can you produce your own planting potatoes um, on your own farm by saving seed? And will this break up the disease cycle? You know, I'm really glad that someone asked that question because I forgot to say uh, during the talk that most potato diseases cannot be transmitted through true seed. So if you start with true potato seed, that is a great way of breaking the disease cycle. Now, there are a small number of viruses and viroids that can be 
transmitted through true potato seed. So this is not um, an absolute. There are very few absolutes in nature. Um, but those are fairly rare viruses and viroids. And so if you are saving seed from plants that, um, that you know, maybe you have on your farm, maybe they are um, from tubers that you have purchased, it is extremely unlikely that they're going to be infected with anything. Um, so yeah, this is a great way of breaking up the disease cycle. And in fact, when I think about a small scale seed potato system that starts with true potato seed, I think it's very analogous to starting with tissue culture plants where you're, you have the same kind of flush through system you start with the true seeds. They um, do not have disease organisms. And then that first generation allows you to do some selection and choose the types of tubers that you want to keep going. And then you can keep on um, planting those back probably for um, maybe up to five years or so before you start to accumulate the same kinds of viruses and other pathogens that you would in any case be getting in a clonal propagation system where you're planting tubers back. So um, in a more philosophical sense, I, I kind of like the idea that you have this flush through of different genetics that you are always um, bringing in. You're always starting some new seedlings and getting some new uh, variable potatoes. And then out of that, you're taking what you find most palatable and most enjoyable to grow or most profitable. And um, yeah, there's just a constant flow of interesting potatoes going through your farm. So yes, the less philosophical question is yes. Is, <laughs> okay. <laughs> breaks up the disease cycle. Yeah. Okay. Well, unfortunately um, we're out of time right now. Um, we, I, I will follow up with the last person who asked a question. We can probably get away with one more question here before we yeah, run out of time, we but, can. but we, we can do that. But let me just mention to those of you who need to leave um, that we did record this webinar. We're going to have it up on the eOrganic YouTube channel within one to two weeks at most. And um, we thank all of you for coming. And let's just get to that final question in case anybody wants to hear it as well. Would the true potato seeds tend to adapt to local conditions over time as well? Yeah, so that's um, again an advantage of starting with true potato seeds, that what's gonna thrive in your conditions is, um, is gonna be what's adapted to your conditions. Um, certainly there's a possibility of narrowing the genetic base. And so it's good to be maybe introducing some different, uh, different varieties into your system from time to time. Um, but certainly, yes, this is, uh, this is something where you're gonna be able to adapt your potatoes to your growing conditions. Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining us and thank you so much, Rue, for this very interesting and informative presentation. Um, I hope everyone stays healthy and that you'll all join us for more webinars, which you can find on our schedule at eorganic.org. Thanks very much. Thank you.